fact, I brought an example of the calorimetry with me if you wanted to see it sometime. This is, this is one I, I haven't actually used. I had four of them built, but uh, it, it, it shows the... Uh, it, it's homemade, or I had this person who is a technician up in Oregon. Uh, he's retired from California, worked as a technician in California. But it's, it's two copper pipes. The outside is, is, is placed in the water bath. The water comes up to about here in, in the water bath. And if you look inside it, the, the, the second tube is smaller. And it's, there's insulation between the two tubes. And this is just sealed off with silicon rubber at the top. Let's slip down it. And copper is one of the best conductors of heat. And so you have good heat conduction except it has to go through the insulation and that's, that retards the heat, so that allows you to make measure bigger temperature differences. So then, it's just a copper tube inside a copper tube. Right. And there's, what kind of insulation is that? Uh, like foam? He, he did some with foam and some, it was up in Oregon, he was, he was working a lot of wood, so he did another one with sawdust, packed sawdust. And, and actually the sawdust gives you a little better results, better insulation than the foam. But the foam was just a foam that you put around pipes that just fit down between the two tubes. Polyurethane. Right, yeah. And, uh, but, so two of them have foam and two of them have sawdust, organ sawdust. And the cell is this size. This is... Very small. This is pretty close to the diameter of the Fleischmann Pond's Duracell, 2.5 centimeter diameter, so it's is similar in diameter to the Fleischmann pond cell. The reason you want it narrow is because the gas will keep the mixing going on good. So, so you have good mixing of the so good, good stirring. That was the one criticism early on was uh, you, that they was, wasn't good stirring, but there's very good stirring if you make it narrow. If you made a, a big wide cell like this big around, then there wouldn't be good stirring. But the gas is coming straight up stir everything very well in a cell this size. This only shows one electrode, that's the the counter electrode. That's the, uh, is that a platinum? Yeah, that's anode? platinum, that's platinum. The, uh, there's a, there'd be a rubber, a, be, be a, a stopper made out of Teflon that have holes in it that you put the, uh, the thermistors through and the palladium through. And, uh, and then you would, you would insulate the wires with a shrink Teflon or something, so only the part showing would be down here at the bottom. The, the rest of the wire would be insulated. And uh, a, a critical feature is you need a heat transfer fluid between the glass and the first copper tube. And so I've used Mobile One oil as a, for heat transfer. It's a synthetic oil. And uh, I, another critical factor is you, you, want the, you want the oil level to come up less than the liquid level. Li liquid level might be to here, but you want, you want all the heat to be transferred where the oil is. So it, as you electrolyze this away, the liquid level changes, but the main heat pathway doesn't change because the, the oil level is only up to here. So the liquid stays above the oil level, and that's, therefore the, the, this doesn't change very fast with the liquid level because you maintain a constant surface area of oil that is conducting the heat from the cell to the copper tube with the oil in between. Now Martin Fleischmann does that in the Duracell by by silvering the top and the liquid stays within the silver region. Well see the silver blocks radiation heat transfer and so the, as the liquid level changes it stays within the silver level and it doesn't show that dependency. Why does the water go down when you have it closed at the top? Well, it, 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 the, water's, the heavy water or light water is electrolyzed to hydrogen gas and deuterium gas. Or, I mean, hydrogen gas and deuterium or else an auction at the, at the anode. I get auction at the anode and you get hydrogen or deuterium at the cathode, depending on whether you're using light water or heavy water. So the water goes down because it changed into a gas, a hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Now you can minimize that effect if you just want to ma add, make, make up water or heavy water each day. But I was trying to investigate the, the effect of the level, and so I was letting it drop quite a ways. And, and I found that I could measure the change, which is pretty small, is 
0.0002 watts per degree per milliliter. It's small, but I can measure it. Wow. <laughs> so so the, the cell constant doesn't change too much with the liquid level, but enough that it can make a difference for small amounts. And so these are things that MIT and Caltech never even thought about, mm. how you can maintain a co constant surface area for heat transfer. Uh, they, they never even mentioned that at all. But I maintain a constant surface by keeping the oil level below the top of the water level. And that, that keeps everything without, from changing very much. So you've got that test tube inside your inner copper tube right. and you fill the surrounding area with Mobile One oil. Go to an auto shop or anywhere and buy Mobile One oil. <laughs> and I, and I, I caught them because uh, you need to know the heat capacity. You, you, the, the glass and the metal and the water all contribute a heat capacity to the system and so does the oil because I, I, made, I put the thermistors on the outside in my design. I just I, I, I put them to the outside wall and, and that's where I measure the temperature. And Martin measures his inside but I measure it outside. That makes it even less sensitive to the liquid level by measuring mm -hmm. in the oil. But, but that makes the oil part of the heat capacity so I had to find out the heat capacity of that oil and use it and, and, and I could calculate the heat capacity just theoretically and then I could measure it experimentally and it came out very close. About 450 joules per degree is the heat capacity and, and, and I, you can measure that and calculate it. It comes out pretty, pretty close together. Heavy water is a little bit different because it has a different heat capacity than regular water so there's a slight difference. I think heavy water is the 450 and light water is maybe the 420, 422 I think and so you have to consider that effect as well and then now, what do you use as a power source for the uh, electrolyzer? Uh, I, I have a commercial instrument, uh, Princeton Applied Research. Uh, it can supply a constant current or a constant voltage, whatever you want. I always use constant current. Current, current is a very easy thing to control. Mm -hmm. just set, you just set it at the current you want and, and carry out your experiment. And what types of current do you use? What well, amounts? Well, if you're doing co-deposition, uh, early on, from, the, from the people who developed that method, Spock and Boss in San Diego, they use six milliamps for, during the co-deposition, and that's enough that all the palladium is deposited in 24 hours using six milliamps. And then when you go to run the experiment, then you turn it up to 100, 200, maybe up as four or 500 milliamps. So that you change the current, you, put, you push it up quite high when you run the experiment. Six milliamps is not much, it's just enough to do the you can see gas bubbles coming off, so you are electrolyzing the heavy water to deuterium gas and oxygen. You can see bubbles on the gas on the cathode, and uh, and but a lot of the deuterium goes inside the palladium and loads it up with deuterium. Mm -hmm. And when that process is done, then that's when you turn the current up. And uh, uh, this, uh, I, I I generally use around 300 milliamps as a typical value, but I can go to 500 or even or lower to 200, 100 somewhere in that range. And then co-deposition, you'll see the effect after it's deposited, it takes one day to, for the deposition, and then you can you can measure the excess heat within the next day, the second day, third day, fourth day. The experiment I ran in Japan, I, I, I had the experiment ran and completed in seven days. And, and it, with, a, with a regular palladium rod, it takes you maybe two weeks before you even see an effect. Here you see the effect right away. Now, I measure the temperature to a hundredth of a degree. Plus or minus, I, I can read it accurately to 0 0.01 degrees. Hmm. And sometimes it's not much is going on, it'll just sit there at, point, at reading to a hundredth degree and just be steady for a while. <laughs> and, and then uh, if you see an effect, it might, it might start going up. Now this looks like a very simple setup. What's so difficult about it? Getting it to work. <laughs> It's not hard to get it set up. It's just uh, understanding all the variables that are going on and know how to control them, and understanding what, what what causes changes. Like the liquid level does still cause a change, so you need to know what that change is so I can account for it. If I don't add the makeup water every day, I've got to account for the fact the level is changing. I can I can calculate how much that level changes. It, uh, if you use 100 milliamps it, of current. The level changes by 
0.807 milliliters per day, less than one milliliter per day. If, if, if I go to 300, then it's about 2.4 milliliter change per day, We're using 300 milliamps. And that's just pu purely from Faraday's law. But that agrees pretty well with what I see, and that's how I rule out mm -hmm. recombination because the amount of water electrolyzed is close to Faraday's law. That I, it's actually, I actually lose a little bit more water than Faraday's law because so, a little bit of water is carried out as a vapor by the gases coming out. They're bubbling up and mm -hmm. they carry away some, some of the water as vapor. But you can calculate that because you can theoretically calculate that effect and it's about 4%. Maybe if you get 100 grams of water, you'd maybe get 4 grams extra came out due to vapor. Are you going to be setting this one up? Uh, I, I could, but I, the one I, I've been using is, very, is almost identical. And I've already got it calibrated, so... I, I pretty well stuck with it, and I've just I've taken this to the ACS meeting in in San Francisco, and it was it was filmed and, and on the on the internet showing this with some positive comments and some negative comments. <laughs> some people said it was too crude and didn't think it could be accurate, but it is very accurate as far as I can yeah. tell because you you have a good conductor, uh, and then you have insulation in between, and you have a good heat transfer medium mobile oil between the cell and the copper. And not only that, I, I pack all this area here, clear up to here, with insulation. So I block the heat flow out the top. So uh, so you, I, I force, unlike MIT where most of the heat went out the top, I force my heat to come out through the walls to the water bath. And to get accurate results you have to do that. You have to block this heat pathway. Mm -hmm. There's insulation down at the bottom. This, The bottom is about here and this is filled with insulation too because you don't want heat going out the bottom either. See, the glass fits about like that, and you want all the heat flow to just be from the glass directly through the walls to the and water. And very well insulated here at the bottom, and, and all this at the top is insulation. So the heat doesn't have any choice where it's going to flow. Well, sometimes simplicity is the best. Right. Yes. Yeah. If you can do the simplest thing, what you want, <laughs> yeah. Com complicated design is good. And I have a whole box of these. I. Just pull a new one out for each experiment, and I, I save the contents of each experiment in case anything that came up. I need to go back and see what if there's any transmutation going on. I have the palladium still in there. Uh, if I had money and somebody wanted to look at that, I could do that. Regular glass poisons these cells. I understand. That is not what I've heard. Uh, in fact, this talk I'm preparing. Uh, pe some people, like the people in France that did this, they did repeated flash and pond cell, they say <coughs> the lithium hydroxide, LiOD, when you do a regular experiment with a palladium rod, it attacks the glass, and forms silicates, and they deposit it on the palladium, and, and that that is needed in order to get the effect. And, and that's why it takes one or two weeks in a normal experiment before you get the effect, because you have the... Uh, you need the blocking going on to block the surface and create high over voltages and that increases the loading because the higher over voltage you get higher loading and then you need that to get the like I have a view graph. You want should I show you a view graph of that schematic? Of a, sure. Of how that this, this is a schematic of what I was talking about. Uh, Pyrus glass itself contains LiOD and it attacks the glass forming silicates silicates deposited on the electrode. So after a week or two of a regular palladium, you, you wind up with a, a, a silicates around the surface that block the surface, and the only currents can go is in the little gaps. Again, this is kind of back to, I, I guess, Ed Storm's idea. You have these little gaps, and, and you get very high currents in there, and then you start seeing the excess heat effect because that the, 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 the uh, blocking blocks deuterium from coming back out, and it drives higher current drives more deuterium into it and so you get higher and higher loading and, and when you get the loading high enough then according to McCubrey when you're above the ratio of 0.85 of deuterium to palladium then you start seeing excess heat and, and this this is a, a, a explanation for why it takes a week or two to see the effect and it, this actually came from a discussion with Martin Fleischman himself that I had a, a, a dinner, I think there's a group of us there, and he was explaining why he thought the glass and silicates 
needed time to, for this effect to take place. But if you run it with boron, you already have boron, it could be on the surface and maybe it uh, is present as B2O3 on the surface because it could I guess oxidized on the surface. And so you, you already have the blocking oxide uh, right at the beginning of the experiment. And so we saw excess heat with palladium boron in the first 57 hours. We, we could see the excess heat effect starting off. Mm -hmm. Not after a week or, or two weeks, it was in the first period of the electrolysis. The first two days, we started seeing excess heat. But cold fusion, what I'm trying to do with cold fusion, I would like to find an experiment that anybody could reproduce. That's what we need. <laughs> yeah.